the first presentation <coughs> will be uh, delivered by Dr. Arkin. Dr. Arkin is the David Nathan Distinguished Professor of Pediatric at Harvard Medical School and uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator at Boston Children's Hospital. He previously served as Chairman of the Department of Pediatric Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and he received uh, numerous uh, awards. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Arkin, he is uh, going to uh, present emerging gene therapy for uh, hemoglobinopathies. Dr. Arkin. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, you can hear? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, thank you. So I will first um, like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to present. And uh, what I would like to do is first give some of the scientific background and then um, give you the latest on what's happening in the field of uh, gene therapy and gene editing for the hemoglobin offices. I probably don't need to remind uh, this audience that the hemoglobin offices are a global uh, disease and global burden. Uh, and this comes from a review by David Weatherall of uh, sort of the distribution of hemoglobinopathies and reminds us that there are hundreds of thousands of individuals affected with these disorders worldwide. And I'm speaking particularly of beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, more than 300,000 new births a year. Uh, and it's also uh, anticipated that the number of, of individuals affected will increase over time, uh, particularly if uh, infectious disease comes under control so that uh, children who are born uh, with these disorders will actually uh, survive to adulthood. So the two disorders are obviously sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia is probably more prevalent in, in the Saudi Arabian area and involves many mutations which affect beta globin synthesis and therefore uh, formation of adult hemoglobin. In the case of sickle cell disease, there's a point mutation in amino acid 6, uh, which affects the protein such that the uh, the protein will polymerize in, in so-called sickle, and that obviously affects the adult beta globin gene as well. At the top is the structure of the globin locus, the beta locus in man on chromosome 11. Just want to emphasize that the genes are ordered embryonic fetal and adult uh, on the chromosome the way they're expressed. Fetal hemoglobin was uh, described quite early and, and recognized as a modifier of severity for both sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Uh, the data here pertains particularly to sickle cell disease, but in 1948, a pediatrician, Janet Watson, described that the newborns uh, with that are destined to have sickle cell disease are not affected um, phenotypically at birth or in the first few months. And she hypothesized that was due to the expression and presence of fetal hemoglobin, which is protective, and that's correct. And in a study of uh, sickle cell patients, a natural history study in the United States, uh, survival was higher in patients with higher levels of fetal hemoglobin. And the same can be replicated in individuals with beta thalassemia. So the, the problem that, that we've addressed in the scientific basis of a lot of the recent excitement in the field is to try to understand what regulates this switch from gamma, the fetal genes, there are two fetal genes in the human, uh, to beta, the adult gene, which occurs around the time of birth. And in adults, we have about 1% fetal hemoglobin, which is restricted to a small population of cells called F cells. And the uh, consensus in the field has been that if we could increase this 1% level to something like 20% of fetal hemoglobin, but distribute it more or less equally among cells, that would be very protective in sickle cell disease and beneficial in beta thalassemia, and if one increased that level even uh, slightly higher, it would essentially be curative in patients. Uh, one could reactivate the silent fetal gene to essentially replace a defective or missing adult beta chain. 
And really the crux of the problem has been to try to understand how to do this or and really what controls this switch. Uh, this has been a problem study for many, many years, and this is a timeline of studies in, in this area uh, starting in the uh, 1940s going to the present. And I just want to, I won't go through this at all, but I just want to emphasize really the longstanding interest in the field and really the, the uh, attention, that's, attention that's been uh, devoted to this topic uh, by many investigators over many years. The breakthrough in the field in terms of understanding this uh, phenomenon, the switch, occurred in 2007-2008 with the introduction of genome-wide association studies, which are depicted here, in which one measures the amount of fetal hemoglobin, the level in individuals, and tries to correlate that with conditions in the genome. Uh, and the studies are summarized here, one from Swile Thien in the UK, and then a study from Antonio Cao and others in Sardinia identified uh, three loci associated with increased fetal hemoglobin. Uh, these loci were uh, assigned to short armor chromosome 11, which is the globin cluster, which is not surprising. Uh, the MIB locus on the long armor chromosome six, and there was other evidence suggesting uh, that is a region that it could affect uh, hemoglobin F production. That probably affects cellular differentiation. But the new finding was the, the gene BCL11A on the short armor chromosome 2. Uh, and if one sums the contribution of three these three loci to the entire genetic variation, the hemoglobin F levels in populations, it's at least 50%, which is by these kinds of genome-wide association studies, really an astounding genetic contribution. Uh, we focused on BCL11A for many reasons, particularly that it was a new factor and uh, could have a direct role in this switch process. Now, the challenge in genome-wide association is going from the entire genome of 3 billion base pairs to something uh, of a several base pairs or, or, or several hundred base pairs to understand the relevant target sequences and perhaps have some uh, consequences or implications for disease. Uh, and in my group over the last uh, really decade, uh, we've uh, gone from the genome-wide association right down to specific sequences that are now being used for gene editing uh, to reactivate fetal hemoglobin. And this involved a series of studies to validate a role for B11A in the switching process. We discovered an enhancer within the gene that I'll come to that it's a particularly uh, favorable target for gene editing. And then we've done a number of the preclinical kinds of studies that are required before uh, clinical translation. Now, the real, uh, an important question at the outset is how important is B11A as a single factor? Uh, there could be many, many factors involved in uh, hemoglobin F regulation, and how important is this one factor? And uh, the perhaps the most important experiment to get at this is shown here, in which we used uh, sickle cell engineered mice, uh, in which the mouse genes are removed and the and human genes are put in the mice and in this case, sickle uh, adult genes, so the mice have sickle cell disease. And we cross these mice with a conditional uh, uh, mutation for BCL11A. And in this case, remove BCL11A in only the erythroid lineage to prevent any effects elsewhere in the mouse. And we asked, could removing BCL11A in these mice uh, reactivate fetal hemoglobin and perhaps ameliorate the uh, disease in the sickle mice. And the result was actually more impressive than we had imagined, and I think you can see that in the uh, blood smear at the top. In the middle is the sickle mouse blood smear, and on the left is the control mice, and on the right the mice have BCL11A knocked out in the erythroid cells, and essentially the hematology is normal in these mice. They express fetal hemoglobin to the, a total level of about 
uh, and it's distributed uh, really widely in, by fax, as you can see, in more than 85% of the cells. Uh, and uh, this ex one experiment showed that removal of B11A in the erythroid lineage is sufficient to abolish sickle cell disease phenotype through reactivation hemoglobin F. This level of 25% uh, is uh, sort of where one, want, one would want the threshold uh, to be to uh, ameliorate disease. It's a little hard to compare this to what it would be in a, in a human individual because these mice have engineered um, uh, genes and they're not quite arranged the normal way, but at least it shows the single factor is really a very potent factor in keeping fetal hemoglobin off. And this is really the basis of almost all work going on now in terms of reactivating fetal hemoglobin for therapy. So really the, the crux of the problem is, is simply shown here. The locus control region, which is the major enhancer for the entire beta globin cluster, uh, has to interact with the downstream genes in order to turn them on either in the fetal liver stage or the adult stage. In the fetal liver stage, the gamma genes are on, these are the fetal genes, and in the adult stage, the beta gene is on. And the repressors that keep uh, the gamma genes off are BCL11A, and another factor called LRF, which I don't really have time to go into in any detail, but it's roughly an equivalent kind of repressor, although we think BCL11A is the major physiological repressor for the switch. So how does BCL11A keep the gamma genes off? This summarizes some of our recent work. The BCL11A is a DNA binding protein, and it recognizes the sequence TGACCA. The sequence is duplicated in the gamma globin promoters, but BCL11A only interacts with the distal one of these two, and it recruits the complex called NERD, which is a repressive complex. And what that does is represses the locus and keeps it closed such that such the gene is not expressed. And the LCR interacts with the downstream beta globin gene. So what drives the expression of gamma in the fetal stage? Well, in the fetal stage, there's an activator protein called NFY, uh, and it binds a sequence called the cat box, CCAAT, and it just so happens the TGACC binding site for B7A, which is duplicated, is overlapping or abutted to a cat box site that's also duplicated. But what's very interesting is that NFY only interacts with the downstream cat box, whereas B11A in interacts with the upstream or the more distal site. Yes, I can. And what happens uh, when B11A comes on at the adult stage, it basically evicts NFY and bumps it out of the promoter, leading to repression. And we think this is the major mechanism for the switch. And what's quite remarkable is there are only 21 base pairs separating these two sites between where B11A and NFY bind. Uh, and really, this is the site at which competition between these two factors really determines the switch. So B11A really has two roles. One is direct repression, that is, it binds the promoter and physically obstructs and evicts the NFY protein. And in addition, it recruits the NERD complex, uh, which has a number of enzymatic functions which contribute to repression. And this is a, a more refined view of the promoter. This is the gamma globin promoter. B11A binds to this region where there's a distal TGACCA, and FY binds at the proximal site, they compete with one another. And the other repressor, LF, uh, LRF, binds around minus 200, and both of these proteins recruit the NERD complex. Uh, in addition, I should mention that the binding sites of both B11A and LRF are sites of rare mutation, not common mutation, but rare mutation in classical hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, situations in which the level of hemoglobin in adults 
is uh, quite elevated, 10 to as much as even 20 or 30 percent. Uh, and so uh, B11A is, is really quite remarkable in that it binds the cis element uh, that's mutated in HPFH. Uh, and so it also is involved in uh, uh, this, these rare syndromes. Now, uh, I hadn't mentioned uh, in really where is the uh, common variation that's detected in GWAS studies. And to get to that, uh, we uh, asked where were the most highly correlated uh, SNPs or associations within the B11A locus. Uh, they occur within the an intron of the gene, so there's no genetic variation in the protein coding region. And within this large intron, intron 2, there are three DNA hypersensitive sites over about 10 kilobases, which represent really an erythroid specific enhancer within the B11A gene. And we've shown in other studies, this, is, this enhancer is required for expression of B11A in the erythroid lineage, but not in other cell contexts. And therefore, this represents really a unique genetic uh, region for manipulation, because if one knocks this region out, one would knock out erythroid expression of B11A, but not affect B11A in any other tissues. We use CRISPR-Cas9 to really pepper this enhancer with mutations to see if there was a particular region of the enhancer that might be more important than the whole enhancer itself. And what we determined was a very small region next to a GATA sequence, a binding site for the GATA1 protein, within this hypersensitive site in the middle called plus 58. And that's really an Achilles heel for the enhancer. So if one makes a single cut with either a zinc finger editing or CRISPR-Cas9, uh, it approximates deletion of the enhancer to about, uh, it reduces the enhancer function maybe two thirds or three quarters. So B11A levels fall and it relieves repression. And this is really the focus of, of gene therapy and gene editing studies right now, which I'll come to. So B11A is quite unique. It, it really genetics converges on both common genetic variation, which affects the enhancer, and rare genetic variation, which affects where B11A acts in the gamma promoters. And this summarizes really the genetic studies of B11A, that there's common variation, uh, which will affect um, very low levels of hemoglobin F, such that one goes from 1% to 2 or 3% in the high allele, if one deletes the B11A enhancer, one ablates B11A expression, and hemoglobin F would be very high. And in therapeutic targeting of this, one can approximate this, although one still has a little B11A expression. So this is the basis of, of the current genetic studies. So um, how can we leverage this for therapy in the last few minutes? Well, we now believe that the genetic approach has been validated as I'll, I'll to summarize in the next a couple of slides. So the goal then uh, for therapeutics based on B11A is to reactivate fetal hemoglobin uh, through inhibiting either the function of B11A or removing it. And this could be achieved by a number of ways as shown below, knocking out the gene, knocking down expression, editing the enhancer, et cetera. And I'll just summarize sort of where the approaches are right now. Knocking the gene out entirely is, is probably too toxic for hematopoietic stem cells. You also have blade function in B cells if you do this in stem cells. Uh, but another approach is a knockdown, which are ongoing studies uh, from Children's Hospital in Boston. One can edit the enhancer in their ongoing CRISPR-Cas9 editing uh, trials. And the third possibility is uh, uh, mutating the binding site for B11A in the gamma promoter. And there are preclinical studies under development uh, in that regard as well. Uh, so what is the genetic therapy of these disorders? It's to remove hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, modify them ex vivo either with a lentivirus or with gene editing, uh, machinery, 
take those modified cells and reintroduce them into a condition, preconditioned patient. Uh, and obviously there are many, many parameters I don't have time to discuss that are important, which are the fraction of cells modified, the efficiency of the modification, uh, off-target effects, cell dose, preconditioning, many, many topics uh, which we don't have time to go into. So the targets of genetic therapy of the hemoglobin disorders are, are really summarized here now. Uh, the beta globin gene you could uh, imagine in the case of either sickle or in thalassemia, repairing the gene with CRISPR-Cas9 by homology-directed repair, correcting the gene. Uh, that's not in clinical trial now because the efficiency is still quite not quite good enough. What one can knock down the mRNA uh, with shRNA, one can modify the enhancer, mutate the enhancer, uh, or the binding site. Or additionally, one can use the newer approach of base editing, which is suitable to mutate the binding site for BC11A within the gamma promoters. And all of these are being entertained now. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, at the end of December, two uh, small clinical trials were reported, one for Boston Children's Hospital using shRNA in an erythroid-specific manner to reduce B11A in the case of sickle cell disease, and CRISPR-Cas9 by Vertex and um, CRISPR Therapeutics using uh, editing of the B11A enhancer in both sickle cell disease and thalassemia. And both of these studies showed rather dramatic results. Here's the children's study of patient with sickle cell disease, the first one shown on the bottom right, who's now more than two and a half years out from his therapy. After therapy, he had uh, no sickle cells. He's been clinically well, and his F cells are more than 75%, with hemoglobin F at about 25% total. It's um, he's been asymptomatic and well. And an additional patients have been uh, 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 involved in this trial. And what's re most remarkable is the outcome, uh, clinical outcome, is the same in all patients. They're well, they have 75% fetal cells uh, and uh, have enough fetal hemoglobin per cell, per F cell, to ablate sickling. In the case of the gene editing trial by Vertex CRISPR Therapeutics. They attacked the uh, enhancer precisely with a guide RNA that we had described in 2015 uh, and used that in both sickle and thalassemia. He's a sickle cell patient who had essentially 100% F cells and a hemoglobin F of 46% and it's clinically well and a patient with beta-0 thalassemia had a similar kind of outcome. So I now believe that the genetic approaches are validated, and the question then is how can we scale these to larger patient numbers? It's highly resource intensive uh, to perform ex vivo gene editing or therapy. Uh, so the, the thoughts are that one needs to uh, uh, devise uh, improved non-ablative preconditioning methods or uh, it really invent new methods for in vivo gene therapy. And these are both uh, challenging exercises but are being considered in many places. And this summarizes the clinical trials in the, in the gene therapy era for the hemoglobin disorders. And here I've just added also Bluebird with a lentiviral so-called beta addition uh, where one adds a globin gene, one doesn't aim to increase fetal hemoglobin. And that's approved in Europe, but as many of you also probably realize, there's been a recent hold on these trials because of two patients with sickle cell disease who developed cancer or myeloproliferative disease. And the real, the issue under study now is whether this relates to the lentivirus, to uh, interaction of the sickle environment with lentiviruses with uh, preconditioning or is it uh, genetics or bad luck? And I don't think we know the answer at this point. So the take home messages that I wanna leave you with is the mechanism of switching is now uh, coming under focus and is pretty well understood and B11A is a central component. It's a valid target for therapy of the hemoglobin disorders. The clinical trials have moved along very rapidly and show uh, positive results. 
uh, and are likely to be approved, although adverse events need to be watched uh, very, very carefully to evaluate risks and benefits. And I think the future is developing on-target small molecules drug therapy to really impact these disorders globally, and that's really a separate topic. So I'll stop at this point and thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and uh, I'll return for the question and answer session uh, later.